Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the study of the word. We're asking that as we open the pages of the holy writings today, you'll speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. We pray you'll guide us in the study of the scriptures so that what we study will be profitable for each of our lives and for the church as a whole in Jesus' name. Thank you for the answer to our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Last week we began the study of Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. And we're still going to study this same chapter today, still starting from verse 1. As I explained to you last week, whenever we come before the Lord and we approach the Word of God, we must not be in a hurry, as if we're running a relay race and see how many chapters of the Bible we cover in just one session at a go. The most important thing for us will be that we're looking for practical principles from the scriptures so that our lives will be better and the ministry of the church as a whole will be better. And so the purpose of studying the scripture is not to see how much ground we can cover in one study, how many verses we can put into the memory in one study, in one study but to see the spiritual principles that are well laid down in the scriptures so that taking these spiritual principles we can get out things that are practical for our lives here and now. In Acts chapter 13 we have an important subject which is arresting our attention and which I believe the Lord has a lot uh, to teach us from. We're considering the ministry of the church at Antioch. Acts chapter 13, I want to read to you from verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger or Black and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. Let's stop there. Now the Acts of the Apostles, as I've told you before, has preserved for us the history of the early church. And I told you last week that chapters 1 to 12 take up the ministry of the church coming out from Jerusalem and mainly ministering to the Jews of the day. But as you come to chapter 13, you come to an important area of the growth of the church work. And at this time, the church is reaching out from a Gentile church to the Gentile world. That's very important because Jesus Christ had given the Great Commission. And in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he had told the disciples, saying, they shall wait for the promise of the Holy Ghost, the promise of the Father. And that as they waited, the Holy Ghost will come upon them. And he said in verse 8, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We read that verse before, but I want you to notice this. That the Jerusalem church was started in the power of the Holy Ghost. Ye shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. And so then we have understood and we have learned that the church in Jerusalem came out out of the manifestation of the power of the Holy Ghost. 
that same church carried out its evangelistic missionary work in Judea and Samaria again in the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, the church was to be established on the Gentile soil and Antioch, a large famous city, was the place where the first Gentile church was planted, developed, and from which the Holy Ghost himself sent out evangelists and missionaries. Now, if the church at Jerusalem was established in the power of the Holy Ghost and it spread through Judea and Samaria in the power of the Holy Ghost, how about the church in Antioch? Now, we've seen in the church, of, in the church at Antioch that there were spiritual men. These men were spiritual because of the power, the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon them. And so this first Gentile church was established by men that were full of the Holy Ghost. The very first person you see here mentioned, Barnabas, that is in um, Acts chapter 13 verse 1. We're told what type of man he was in Acts 11 24. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. Now, the last man to be mentioned there is Saul. And in Acts chapter 13, verse 9, we're told, Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Now, the first man, the last man among the five that were given here, were full of the Holy Ghost. And you can be sure, these other three were also full of the Holy Ghost. Then we learn this, that the church at Antioch, a Gentile church in the famous large city of Antioch was established by men that were full of the Holy Ghost. The Gentile world ought to learn something from that. Today we're talking about evangelism, we're talking about missionary work, we're talking about we carrying out the great commission and reaching out that the Gentile world must hear. We must not allow the Gentile world to perish. But all those who are carrying on those missionary work anywhere ought to realize that the very first Gentile church in Antioch, that was the first Gentile church in the whole world, that church was established by men full of the Holy Ghost. And if we're going to establish the same church of the Lord, the same church of God, the same church whose foundation is Jesus Christ, and the same church of the Bible, if we're going to establish that similar church, the same church, full of the power of God and carrying out the mission of the Lord, it must be by men that are not strangers to the Holy Ghost. Not only knowing Jesus as Savior, not only knowing God as Father, but knowing the Holy Ghost in the infilling baptismal measure. And now we learn that, that uh, if the church is to grow today and the church is to be established today as it was in the days of old in the Gentile world, it must be by men and women who are no strangers to the Holy Ghost. They are full of the Holy Ghost. Come back to Acts chapter 13, verse 2. And as they ministered unto the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, again, let's emphasize, because it's so important, in the church of today, if we're going to carry the work on as the Lord intended it, the first Gentile church is giving the whole Gentile world an example and a principle that it must be a church if we're going to reach out to the Gentile world around us. The church of today, going to reach out to the world around, must be the church that gives the opportunity and the chance and the free hand to the Holy Ghost to be able to say whatever he wants to say today. In the early church, it was the Holy Ghost that supervised and controlled the missionary work and the missionary outreach. As it was, so it must be. The church that was born and birthed and baptized in the Holy Ghost will only continue if the Holy Ghost is given the same power and the same opportunity and the same liberty. In verse 4, so then, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, it emphasizes the same thing. And as they went on, and it came into a particular place and the need arose and Paul the apostle was to do something now look at verse 9 then Saul who also is called Paul filled with the Holy Ghost he set his eyes on him 
while it's been abundantly proved that the Jewish church from Jerusalem unto Judea, unto Samaria, they expanded, they went as far as they went because of the power of the Holy Ghost. In fact, Jesus said, you don't dare go out without that power of the Holy Ghost. Think about it. Peter, James, John, these were men who had seen miracles that like nobody else in the whole of the Bible days had seen miracles. These were the people that lived with the Lord Jesus Christ and had stayed with him in um, a three-year course. You can't call that a seminary. It's more than a seminary. You can't call that a college. It's more than a college. Because in seminaries and colleges, people only talk about Jesus Christ. And many of those uh, students at the seminary never even hear the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to talk of seeing the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not to talk of even touching the hem of his garment. Many people go to seminary and college without ever touching the border or, the, or the, uh, the hem of the garment of Jesus Christ. But these were people not only touching the hem of the garment of Jesus, not only holding Jesus and uh, uh, having intimacy with Jesus, these were the people that lived, that were intimate, very intimate with the Lord Jesus Christ. And they saw him in the day and in the night, and they saw him on the sea, and they saw him on the land, they saw him ministering, they saw him preaching. And yet after three and a half years, they called them with all that you have seen about me with all that you have known about me with all that you have heard and with even the experience of the Mount of Transfiguration with the closed door example or the closed door experience of getting in with me when I raise the dead and when I do miraculous signs and wonders you cannot leave this Jerusalem until you are baptized in the Holy Ghost think about it and people today, they feel that if you just, you know, read the Old Testament and the New Testament and take some, you know, history and some psychology and take some courses in Bible and administration, you know, they think they're ready for missionary work. Oh, no, sir. You know, those early days, those early people, they needed the Holy Ghost power on them. And you come to the Gentile church in Antioch, the same thing again. The power of the Holy Ghost. Now, come back to this verse 1. There's something we need to point out there. We didn't point it out last week. Verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. Let's stop there. You see, that first Gentile church, the thing that happened there, happened because of the ministry of, number one, the prophet. A person that could see with spiritual eyesight. People that could be inspired by God and they could hear the voice of the Lord and relate it to the congregation, the Gentile church. And the teachers, those who could teach all the doctrines of the word of God, those who could teach about Jesus Christ, about God, about uh, the Holy Ghost, about the mysteries of the kingdom. And they were inspired by God. These were well established and seasoned and matured, inspired teachers of the world. I want to remind you, the first Gentile church in Antioch started with the prophets and teachers. Not prophets alone, not teachers alone, prophets and teachers. And that church was so established, so well established, that now they could send out people. Now, you see the church of today, we have seminaries, Bible colleges, almost in every nation of the world. But then they say that uh, those who are so intimate with God and carry the prophetic ministry and the prophetic burden, you know they are no more necessary. That's what they say. They say the age of miracles totally passed now. They say there is nothing at all that is needed except just, uh, you know, all these people you raise up and put some idea into their heads and send them out and then they can do the work. It can't be done like that. The Bible is given to us so we can get out these spiritual principles and practical notes from the Bible so we can do the work the way it ought to be done. You see, in the first um, Gentile church, these prophets and teachers were the people that helped and handled the world. And among them was sent out. In fact, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Not only that. Now, this first Gentile church, they prayed, they fasted. And think about it in the Gentile world today. There are uh, preachers of the gospel all their lives. They have not known by experience what it means to fast. 
In fact, you know, sometimes they make fun of these uh, uh, spiritual weapons of praying and fasting. You know, sometimes they just say, well, uh, those who are still following Judaism, you know, they may be legalistic, and sometimes they tell their members, their church members, not to eat and to fast, and they say, well, there is nothing like that today, because uh, the bridegroom is uh, with the church, and Jesus has said, I am with you always, and he says, well, as long as I'm with my people, and the bridegroom is there, they will not fast. How do they misinterpret scripture? But you know, Jesus said, while I'm with them physically, they cannot fast. But while I be, when I'm away, then they will fast in those days. And you know, in the early church, this first Gentile church, they ministered unto the Lord, they prayed, they fasted. It was in the midst of that praying and fasting, in the midst of waiting upon the Lord, in the midst of just, you know, put it this way, fasting the body and feasting the soul. You know, the body just rested from taking any meal, from taking any food, but then the soul was uh, feeding on the spiritual meat, the spiritual food. And while the soul was feeding on spiritual meat and spiritual food, while the spirit was feasting on spiritual food, just waiting upon the Lord, ministering to the Lord, then the Holy Ghost spoke and he said, Say, pray it unto me. Can it be that the Gentile church of today is not hearing the voice of God because... The head is taught with knowledge, but then the heart, the spirit does not know what it means to feast on the word of God and the body to fast. Uh, to, to, to take some vacation from eating and eating and eating all the time. It was as they ministered unto the Lord and they prayed and they fasted that the Holy Ghost said. And then after that, uh, in verse 3, even after the Holy Ghost had spoken, when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and he sent them away my brother my sister if you jump verse 1 and jump verse 2 and you come on to verse 3 and you lay empty hands on empty heads nothing will happen you know I will not uh, put my head down for somebody who has never prayed and fasted somebody who has never had an experience with the Holy Ghost Somebody who doesn't know the voice of the Holy Ghost. Somebody who doesn't know the power of the Holy Ghost. I just put uh, my head down. I say, lay your hand on me. There is nothing in that hand. <laughs> Don't let them waste your time. But you know, these people were prophets and teachers. And they were busy ministering to the Lord. And after they had fasted and prayed, and the Holy Ghost had moved and spoken in their midst, then they sent them away by laying hands on them. If that man has been waiting upon the Lord, and there is something in his heart and something within him and something in his hand and he lays the hand upon you then that is meaningful but the point i'm emphasizing is this if the church of today the gentile church if we want to do anything at all if we want to reach out at all in evangelism in missionary work in the salvation of souls in the regions beyond we must come back to giving the right place to the holy ghost in the church there must be praying, there must be fasting, there must be ministering to the Lord, and there must be the producing of, and the developing of spiritual men and women who are spiritual enough to be able to understand the way of the Lord and the word of the Lord and to be able to hear the voice of the Lord. Now, I told you last week that in this um, chapter, in a passage we're reading, we see, number one, spiritual men spiritual men then spiritual ministry spiritual mission and then spiritual ministration but um, let me talk to you my brothers and sisters many times you you say well I want to be a spiritual man that's a good desire and there are people who are not here tonight members of our church but they consistently and constantly miss out Monday Bible study. They want to be spiritual men and women. That's a good desire. But my brother, you want to be a tailor. And all the time you sit in mechanics workshop, you'll never be a tailor. You want to produce a maze. And all the time you go to land, you go to sit in a farm of somebody who is just producing palm kernel. You'll never produce maize. There are so many churches and there are so many members of many churches. It's not enough to just be a member of a particular church. 
you must uh, determine in your mind what type of man what type of woman do you want to be if you want to be an engineer at last and then eventually you just stay in a college of medicine you'll never be an engineer and if you want to be a medical doctor in your life and that is the consuming passion of your life you say oh lord i just want to be a medical doctor and you stay in a law school all your days of studying you'll never be a medical doctor you want to be spiritual men and women you must stay in a church that has the capacity and the possibility of producing spiritual men and women you know sometimes you hear some um, ignorant believers oh they say it doesn't matter which church you go it matters it matters if you want to be a real spiritual man is real spiritual woman it matters now look at this Antioch church this is the right church to be you know if I were alive in those days and I saw many many churches and I saw a church where, you know, Barnabas is there, a good man full of the Holy Ghost. Paul is there, a good man full of the Holy Ghost. And other people were there, prophets of the Lord, teachers of the Lord. And I saw another church somewhere, a church at Ephesus, where Paul came and he said, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, What do you mean? We have never heard of the Holy Ghost since we believed. Who is he? you know if i saw a church like that i'm telling you my mind i don't know your mind i'm just telling you my mind i'll tell you i go to the church in antioch because i want to be a spiritual man i don't want to be in a church where you ask them a question have you received the holy ghost since you believed and they said well we don't even know who is that we've never heard of the holy ghost let them carry on their church business i want to be in a church where they can develop me as a spiritual man where they can develop me as a person that will be full of the holy ghost myself and then i will go out and do the work of the lord you see are you telling us uh, that we should stay in this church that's exactly what i'm telling you if you have a purpose to work for god if you want to be a man of power a man that is spiritual a man that knows what you want to do in life a man that wants to do something definite for the lord in your life you want to stay among people who can raise you up and develop you and make you matured and be a man and a woman full of the holy ghost if you want to be full of the holy ghost say amen, amen. you know people don't talk like this in other places but we talk like this because God has a plan for your life God has a plan for your life and uh, you ought to know the plan God has for your life and whenever you come on a Monday whenever you come on a Thursday whenever you come on a Sunday the desire of your heart ought to be oh Lord I'm coming here because I have a purpose in my heart I want you to raise me up as a spiritual man as a spiritual woman and if that is the goal if that is the aim of your life the Lord will do it in Jesus name Amen. Now we've talked about these spiritual men. I talked to you so much about them last week. Now let's go to spiritual ministry. Spiritual ministry. Let's look at verse 2. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Now they were ministering to the Lord. What does that mean? That means they just came together to praise the Lord, to worship the Lord, to offer themselves to the Lord, and to just tell the Lord, Oh Lord, we are consecrated, fully consecrated unto you. What is your desire for us? What is your will for us? What will you have us to do? They came to minister unto the Lord. They didn't come together because they actually needed healing, or they needed uh, you know, promotion, or needed anything. They just wanted to praise the Lord, worship the lord sing unto the lord yield to the lord commit themselves to the lord just to lay themselves bare and open before the lord as they ministered unto the lord actually that is the calling of the believer in um, first peter chapter 2 verses 5 and 9 first peter chapter 2 verse 5 ye also as lively stone are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god by jesus christ you know that is what we are called for that is what we that's why we're converted it says to offer up spiritual sacrifices to god you know we come together and we say lord we just come to offer unto you there are times believers ought to come together just to worship just to praise the lord 
just to rejoice before the Lord, just to come and offer up unto God spiritual sacrifices. And God will say, what do you want? Do you want healing? And we say, no, we didn't come for healing today. Do you want uh, employment? We didn't come for that today. Do you want anything from me? We didn't come for that today. We just wanted to come together to say how much we love you. How much we just want to praise you. How much we know you have done for us in the past. And we just came to show our gratitude today. Only to offer up spiritual sacrifices unto the Lord. And then to come and lay our lives on the altar. And to say, Lord, we come before the altar. We just come before the consecrating altar. And we say, our lives our bodies our talents our time everything we have everything we hope to have we come to lay everything before you not coming to just ask for this and ask for that there is a time for petition but then there is a time for praise and worship and praying and ministering and this is what they came together to do to offer spiritual sacrifices unto the lord have you ever uh, sometimes gone to your father and your father is expecting that well you, you have come again you are going to say well i need this i need this i need that and uh, instead of asking anything you just uh, said daddy i just came to appreciate you that you are my father i'm so proud of it anywhere i go i look back and i think of home and i just remember your face and your stature and the home and the way you take care of mommy the way you take care of the home the way you take you think of us children i just i just came to tell you not that i came to ask anything money or clothes i just came to tell you i appreciate you more than any other man in the whole world i'm just grateful to god you are my father what are you doing you are ministering to your father you are sacrificing the praise and worship, uh, you know, in a minor way, unto your Father. When we come to God and we just say, we just come to you and we just say, Oh Lord, how wonderful you are. Great is your faithfulness. You've done this for us. You've done this for us. You saved us. You sanctified us. You baptized us in the Holy Ghost. You are teaching us the Word of God. You make us to belong to a church like this. And every time spiritual truth is brought out, Oh Lord, you are wonderful. Just to praise you. That's called ministering unto the Lord. Have you ever seen some delegates that go to a governor of a state? And you know, all the other delegates have been coming, help us in our local government area. You know, we need this in our local government area. Another set of people will come, we need this, we need good road. But you know, this delegate, they come on this time and, um, you know, they're sitting in the waiting room and eventually they are called in and they say the governor in a court call and the governor said oh yes what can i do for you and uh, the spokesman of the team will say well honorable governor we just came to tell you that we know the magnitude of the work you're doing in this stage just to appreciate you and to tell you that whatever all those people are writing in the papers we there are some people that so appreciate you that back you up anytime that will defend you anywhere anytime we came not to ask for any favor we came not to comment and not to criticize anything in the state we just came to tell you where there are some people in this state that actually truly appreciate you we're not looking for anything just to come and tell you you're doing a good job keep on doing it you know that governor will be so happy he'll be so happy and he might be thinking of what to do for them uh, positively after that fellowship after that meeting that's it when we do that to the lord that is ministering to the lord that we just go to the lord and we say lord we didn't come to ask anything only to minister unto you i read in the time of abraham lincoln in the time of abraham lincoln being a president of america Many of the people had been saying, well, uh, do this for us. At the time they had uh, their, uh, their war, you know, many people wrote in the papers, they opposed, we could have done this, we could have done that. But there was a day that an old woman came in. And uh, Abraham Lincoln said, woman, what can I do for you? And the woman looked up to the president and said, Abraham Lincoln, I just came to tell you how much I appreciate you as a president. You've done so much for our uh, country, United the States, the United States. And I just came to tell you, if nobody else is telling you that, keep on doing the good job. It's so wonderful. We're proud of you as a president. And tears came on the eyes of the president and said all along since he became a president people have been coming and he'll say do this for us do this for us anytime i see somebody in my office i know again they have a complaint 
I know that they, they want something, but you are the first person to come, old woman, to tell me something good and you are not asking for anything. You know, the president was so happy. That's the type of thing spiritually the church at Antioch was doing. They came to minister unto the Lord and they prayed and they fasted and they were just worshiping the Lord, praising the Lord in fasting and praying. And you know, we as believers in the church of today, we ought to do the same thing as well a number of times, frequently of course on individual basis and also even as a church together in verse 9 first peter chapter 2 verse 9 but ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood an holy nation a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light in hebrews chapter 13 hebrews chapter 13 verses 15 and 16 by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to god continually that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name but to do good and to communicate forget not for with such sacrifices god is well pleased now here we are told that whenever we come before the lord there is something we ought to do continually. We offer sacrifice of praise. Sacrifice of praise unto the Lord. And you know, it's every time we do that. It doesn't matter uh, whether you have just got healing or whether you have just been delivered or whether you have just been promoted. Now, whatever the condition, we ought to offer sacrifice of praise unto the Lord. Sacrifice of praise. Think about uh, Paul and Silas in the prison. The average Christian will say that is not the place to praise God. There is nothing to praise God for. But you know, in the prison, Paul and Silas, they prayed and then they sang praises unto the Lord. Praising the Lord should be done continually. That's called ministering unto the Lord. And the church should be doing that every time. Ministering unto the Lord. And whenever we are praying and fasting, we ought to spend some of the time ministering unto the Lord. Just saying, oh Lord, how wonderful you are. How great thou art. How great your love is. The wonderful things you have done the testimonies we have even when we're suffering some persecution there ought to be a time to minister to the lord praising the lord and you know at the time when paul and silas were ministering to the lord like that and they were praying and praising the lord then an earthquake happened and a miraculous thing happened in that prison and so remember next time come here to the lord enter his courts with what with praises and uh, in acts chapter 13 I'm reading verse 2 again. As the minister to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. You know, sometimes the church is uh, too busy organizing for missionary work. And say, no, if you do this that way, if we do that that way. And the Holy Ghost is not allowed to speak his mind. But you want to understand this is the work of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost uh, has something to say. And it is when we come together praying and praising the Lord, ministering to the Lord, the Holy Ghost will say his mind out, separate me. Now that means set apart unto me. Now tells you something. The Holy Ghost has said, this work, missionary work, it's the work I have called them unto. And I want you to separate these people. Now, I've told you that the leadership in the church, they were full of the Holy Ghost. Let me say something about the church itself. The church itself and the membership are also full of the Holy Ghost. You say, how do we know that? Because we don't read that directly. Well, can't you see this? Uh, Barnabas and Saul were the best men among all their ministers. The best, the cream among all their ministers and when the holy ghost said separate unto me barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto i have called them if that church was not a church full of the holy ghost in the membership you know they will react against that they'll say no those are the best people we have in the church how can they go to any other place no we're not going to allow that let's pray and fast again let's uh, decree against it no these people are submissive unto the holy ghost you know it's wonderful when the leadership is full of the holy ghost when all the leaders are full of the holy ghost and the church as well they are sharp they have insight and when the holy ghost is moving the holy ghost is talking they can, they can recognize it and they will allow whatever the holy ghost wants of course the holy ghost is intelligent and reasonable he sent out uh, 
Barnabas and Saul because he wanted the best men for the best job. And as he said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, unto the work whereunto I have called them. We're told in verse, th in verse 3, when they had fasted and prayed, Barnabas and Saul did not run out immediately, saying, oh yes, we have heard the voice of the Holy Ghost, we're going, we're going, bye-bye. And the things they were doing before in the church at Antioch, the praying and fasting, they will not continue anymore. They will not be under anybody's control anymore. It's good to read the Bible. And even when the Holy Ghost has spoken to be, to be patient and allow the normal things to go on and do the right thing at the right time and not this, in the right attitude. Do the right thing at the right time and uh, in the right attitude. They continued still with the Antioch church praying and fasting until that ministry unto the Lord, the praying and the fasting was finished. And it was only when that was finished, now they went. After they had laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Now, let me talk about laying on of hands. Sometimes uh, we've heard some of our workers, especially outside the uh, legal stage, and some of our missionaries, um, you know, saying, uh, we need the laying on of hands. Well, laying on of hands is not just to be done uh, indiscriminately. Laying on of hands is uh, to be done with the wisdom of God and the leading of the Lord. As you study from the Old Testament to the New Testament, you'll find Jacob laying hands on those children, conferring or uh, putting uh, the blessing of God upon them. But you see, he did that at old age. He did that with real experience. He did that knowing the plan of God and seeing afar off as a patriarch prophet. As a prophetic patriarch. Seeing afar off with deep prophetic insight. He laid those hands on those people. You remember Moses and Joshua? Moses did not lay hands on Joshua. Even though they were going to the mountain top together and they were coming back. Even though he sent him to go and, you know, finish the battle against those Amalekites in Exodus. Even though he sent him as one of those spies, one of the twelve spies. But when he was to go away at a matured age for a special task. Not that, you know, you just lay hands on every worker and say, well, we're laying hands on you, we're following the Bible. That's not following the Bible. But at a matured age, before he went, he transferred some of the spirit in him on Joshua, and he laid hands on him. And the spirit of power and wisdom came upon Joshua. You remember Elisha and Elijah? You know, Elijah did not give the double portion just, you know, as, uh, as um, Elisha came to him and said, now I'll be following after you, just playing with the power of God. You know, I know some people that they don't take the things of God seriously. They just lay hands on people anyhow. You know, they go about saying, I have the power of God, I have the power of God, come, let me lay hands on you. What are you doing? Laying hands on people is not child's play. And so you know, at last, Elijah asked Elisha, he said, ask me what you want. He said, I want a double portion. Elijah did not immediately say, well, because of uh, what we erroneously call motivation and psychology, and begin to say, yes, you are going to get it, you need it, and uh, begin to just be flippant about the things of God. You know, Elijah became serious immediately. When Elisha talked about a double portion, and he said, you have asked a hard thing, very hard thing. That's not psychology, that's spiritual. That's not motivation. That is deep wisdom and maturity. And then he said, if you see me when I go, it will be so. If not, I'm sorry, it will not be so. And he kept on talking. And Elisha was sharp. And eventually he saw him when he was taken away. He said, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the mantle fell down. And he took that mantle, went back to the seaside and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And that part came upon him. Laying up, on laying on of hands is not child's play. It's not, you know, something that somebody, a young a lady, a young man will just come and say, hey, Pastor, lay hands on me. I had a dream that you were praying for me in the dream. Lay hand on me that I'll be a great man of God. And he will not come to Monday Bible study. He will not come to Thursday meeting. He will not come on Sunday. He is sad of, uh, you know, the miracles God is performing. Oh, man of God, lay hands on me. It's not like that. It's not like that. And you know, while Paul was talking to Timothy, he said, lay hands on no man suddenly. Be very careful. Do it in a matured way. 
And so you see, laying on of hands is something, it doesn't come from the recipient. That is, it doesn't come from the person that wants it. It comes from the man or the person that the Lord wants to use to minister it. Now, let's go on. In verse 4, so they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed on the Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Now they were going on this uh, missionary journey. And as they went, they were going to really do something definite. And on point three here, we, we note four things. Number one, the directive. It was the Holy Ghost speaking in a spirit-controlled church concerning spirit-filled men. That sentence has a lot in it. The Holy Spirit speaking in a spirit-controlled church concerning spirit-filled men. My brothers, my sisters, think about this church. This is your church. And sometimes uh, some people don't understand this church. Sometimes they say we're too fast. Another time they say we're too slow. And another time they say, well, we're too hard and we're too strict. Another time they say, well, we're too, uh, we're too free and we have great faith. And, you know, they say contradictory things. But this is a spirit-controlled church. And we don't just send out people. We want to be led by the Holy Ghost. And there are times that, you know, people are saying, oh, oh I'm right to be sent out. Well, if you are right to be sent out, the Holy Ghost will know. Be patient. The Holy Ghost will not be late. And when the Holy Ghost is allowed to speak in a spirit-controlled church to, to spirit-filled men, wonderful things, mighty things will be taking place, will be happening. And then the departure. Prepared men responded in a praying church and they went on a preaching tour. Deep, deep sentence. You need to really stay on that sentence that you have on that outline to really understand. Prepared men, prepared men. These were men who had given themselves to the study of the word of God. They did. They studied the world. Prepared men. These were good men. Their lives had been changed. Their characters changed. Their nature changed. Everything within them changed until they could respond at a moment's notice to the voice of the Holy Ghost. Prepared men. Matured men. These were men who could go out into regions beyond. Men of another culture. Men of another language. And they could go there because the Holy Ghost had been preparing them. My brother, my sister... You know, they stayed in the Antioch church for some time. After Paul, the, after Paul or Saul had seen that revelation on the road to Damascus, after he had preached in Damascus, after he had been to Jerusalem church, after he had been to Tarsus and Barnabas went to call him from Tarsus and they stayed in Antioch for a long time. And after that, the Holy Ghost spoke and he said, I have a work for them now. Prepared men, prepared men. And you think about um, Barnabas, he had, we have been told his name from Acts chapter 4. How he sold his property and remained in the church. And the people in the church even gave him the name Barnabas, his son of consolation. And he had been a man that knew the work of the Lord, the people of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the doctrines of the Bible, prepared men. And these were prepared men in a praying church. Praying church. Uh, you know there are churches where they don't come praying serious, not to talk of fasting. You know there may be some stereotype, a type of prayer. But you know, they do not actually count uh, praying very, very serious as a task in the church. And uh, they want to do missionary work. Some of those young people, they have been reading some missionary books and they are fired up emotionally. They don't have the spirit of God, the power of God, the wisdom of God, the maturity. It takes. They are not prepared and oh, they say, well, some of our members, they know different languages. Some of our members, uh, they want to get into the adventure of going to other lands. My brother, my sister is more than that. More than that. Prepared men in a praying church now went on a preaching tour. Then the destination, being obedient and submissive, they were led to the largest city in Cyprus to begin a dynamic ministry. Now, God is a wise God. And you know, sometimes uh, I watch uh, what people do. And they travel all around. 
They come to a place like Lagos, they are not really stay in Lagos. Then they go to Badagri, then they go to Ikorudu, then they go to Ekwe. Then, you know, they spend two days there, three days there, four days there. But you know, Paul the Apostle, led by the Holy Ghost, if you ever study the life of that Paul the Apostle, the missionary journeys, he went into uh, this Antioch, uh, as Barnabas called him, and stayed there. That was the largest and famous, most famous city uh, in all that environment. And he stayed there, and then the Holy Ghost sent them out. And uh, if you have read, you look at the letters uh, Peter's written uh, to the various churches, Corinth, a major town. Ephesus, a major town. Thessalonica, a major town. And you see, as you look at uh, where he went, major, major towns. Let me tell you something as we have been following the Holy Ghost. We started in Lagos, a most significant city, not only in Nigeria, but in Africa. That's led by the Holy Ghost. Then we went to state capitals, the most important city in every state. Then as we go to various countries, where do we send our missionaries? Do we send them to a village and we say, well, go and start in one village somewhere because, you know, the accommodation will be cheap there and uh, you won't have a lot of... No, we send them to the capital of each country. And as we send them, it's, you know, led by the Holy Ghost. Because, you know, when the work is to be done and directed by the Holy Ghost, you follow the Bible principle. But you know, there are people that do not know the destination. They do not know the places where they are to go and proclaim the word. I'm not talking of, you know, a young boy just saying, well, okay, then I, I'll be going to Washington, D.C. Well, you'll go without the Holy Ghost and come back to report to us. How do you do this? And I went there, nobody got converted. I'm talking about uh, planning something by the leading, by the ministration of the Holy Ghost. And then the delivery in verse uh, 5. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God. The delivery. That's what they delivered. They preached the word of God. You know, I've been watching people in the Bible, and I study the Bible a lot uh, for various reasons. One on a personal note, because I want to get all the Lord has for me as an individual. Two, because of uh, being a pastor of a church like this, I want to bring fresh spiritual food for you. Every time I stand before this church and I talk, I want to bring something for, for you from the Word of God. I don't want to bring uh, refrigerated food. You know, the Bible passage I put in the spiritual fridge of the brain one year ago, and then I bring it out of the fridge and give it to you cold and lifeless. I don't want to do that. Every time I have to go into the Bible and bring us spiritual meat, fresh, right from the mind of God. And uh, that's why I need to go into the Word all the time. And uh, three, because of being the leader that God has appointed me over various um, branch churches all over Nigeria and many parts of the world. And because of that, I need to get deep into the Bible so we can do this work according to God's way. But listen to me. This is what I want to say. I've been watching people in the Bible. Listen now very well. Do you know all the people that died and that were raised up from the dead? After they rose from the dead, they were not going about preaching their experience, saying, when I died, this is what I saw. When I died, this is what I saw. If they had the opportunity to preach, they preached the word of God. You know, the people that you read off in the Bible, that have had experiences. Maybe they saw an angel, or they had a dream, or they had some experience. I don't find them going about and uh, preaching experience. And going about, you know, one year when I saw an angel, one year when I saw this, one year when I saw that, I don't find that in the Bible. What I find in the Bible is that they went out and they preached the word of God. And it is the word that will save the people. It is the word that will heal the people. It is the word that will deliver the people. And it is the word that will sanctify them. I don't find uh, these people in the Bible uh, say, well, I belong to 25 secret calls before. And not just telling stories of secret calls. But they preach the word of the Lord. Now you see, when you are sent out, either as a preacher, as a state representative, as a pastor of a branch church, or as a missionary to go into another land, what are you to do? Just what they did here. They preached the word unto them. In Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them and confirming the word. The word was signs following the lord wants to use every one of us 
and uh, I believe as the Lord is teaching us this week by week the Lord is preparing us already and the Lord is going to be picking us out sending us out and when we're sent out in the power of the Lord great will be the manifestation of the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives and uh, please uh, tell other people who have not been coming they want to be spiritual men spiritual women they must not miss out meetings tell them they ought to be coming and uh, today we're not able to go through to verse 13 again but i think that's all right don't you think that's all right we're coming back next monday again and we'll start where we have stopped to dig out spiritual meat and spiritual food out of the word of the almighty god rise up and let us pray and my brother my sister anytime you have a point not experience not experience preach the word the word of god not stories of angels and stories and dreams and stories of well you died before this is what happened preach the word of god offer yourself to the lord that's ministering to the lord offer praise and worship to the lord that's ministering to the lord your time your talent your resources all you are and all you have offer unto the lord the lord will use you you're willing to learn 